good afternoon. Uh, I'm Simon Bainbridge. I'm Professor of English Literature at Lancaster University, uh, where I'm currently Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this event today. Uh, the start of the academic year is always an exciting time for us here at Lancaster. Uh, we're delighted to be beginning a new series of public lectures, uh, and we're particularly excited to be doing so having been recognized as the Times and Sunday Times University of the Year. Uh, you can all cheer or stamp your feet or, shall I try it again? Having been recognized as the Times and Sunday Times University of the Year. Thank you very much. Uh, as a reader of comics and graphic novels since I was a boy, and as a great fan of The Walking Dead, uh, it's a real pleasure for me to welcome you uh, to this afternoon's event, and particularly to introduce today's speakers, uh, the accomplished comics artist and comics laureate, Charlie Adlard, uh, and my colleague from the Department of English and Creative Writing, Dr. Andrew Tate. Charlie is best known as the illustrator of The Walking Dead, but has illustrated for many other comic series, including Batman, The X-Files, and Judge Dredd. He's received many industry awards, including an Eisner Best Artist nomination for his work on The Walking Dead. Today's event uh, is a preview for the Lakes Comic Arts Festival, which is taking place in the coming days. We at Lancaster University are very proud to support the festival by sponsoring sessions and by supporting the post of UK Comics Laureate, which Charlie undertakes along with his illustrating work. As Comics Laureate, Charlie works to raise awareness of comics as tools for increasing literacy and encouraging creativity in young people. So the format for today is that Charlie will be in discussion with Dr. Andrew Tate. Andrew's area of study includes literature and aesthetics and the use of visual arts in published work. He's the co-director of a project called Reopen, which seeks to connect authors and artists, teachers, and arts organizations to highlight the use of comics and graphic novels in education. Uh, so I think Charlie and uh, Andy are gonna talk for about half an hour, and then we'll have about half an hour where we can open the floor to questions too. Can I, I've been asked to remind you just before we begin to ensure that you've turned your mobile phones off, or at least to silent, uh, but once you've finished doing that, can I ask you to join me in welcoming Charlie Adlard. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and, uh, and welcome. It's so good to see so many of you here, and I know lots of you have questions, uh, and I want to kick off with a, with a question of my own about... Uh, Charlie is a young man, so... Um, <laughs> not now. Not now. Uh, right. Well, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying you're now an old man, but you're, you're now a <laughs> comics laureate. You know, take you back into the 70s, mm -hmm. um, and think about you... Um, maybe your mates are playing football. Are you somewhere else in the schoolyard uh, drawing? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I, I, put it this way, uh, art is the only thing I can do. Um, <laughs> when I was at school, uh, sport, I am the most uncoordinated person you could possibly meet. You throw a ball at me, uh, I, well, there's no point, you know. The, my nightmare scenario is if at that time when you're walking along the park and there's a bunch of kids playing football and it accidentally <laughs> comes towards you and they're yeah. going, well, I might kick it back in like, oh, is there anyone else around? <laughs> you know, and then you kick it and you completely miss everybody and it goes off there. You know, that's, that's me. So, and again, I was, yeah, academically, brutally average to say the least. So the art school at school was literally the place I hung around in. So it was, a, it was a happy space for you. So, oh, um, yeah, absolutely. If you picked last or next to last for football, you become an academic <laughs> or you uh, become comics laureate. So that's kind of, that's an encouragement for us all. In lots I, of th I think so, uh, yes. And you're, and you're now <laughs> illustrating. Did you used to copy comic books? Is that where you started? Did, you, did things come from your imagination? Did you sit down and, and, and draw your favourite kind of TV heroes? Or, or where, where did it start in that sense? Um, oh, interesting. Um, I, I never actually copied comic books. Um, my big, biggest inspiration came from 1972, and it's one of my earliest memories where my dad actually bought for me 
a copy of The Mighty World of Marvel number one, which was the British reprint anthology of, of various Marvel comics, obviously starting off from the 60s. So I think the first issue had Spider-Man, The Incredible Hulk, and Fantastic Four. Um, that, which is, that's not it. <laughs> and um, I, it was like from there, everything just sprang into life. Um, I, I remember really early on, you know, in my sort of, you know, I was about six or seven then when, when I had that. And uh, I remember just drawing, um, my, my dad, he ran a number of small businesses and one of them was a news agent. So I was lucky because I had just free pen and paper then. And he just used to get me drawing pads by the bucket load and biros and whatever. I didn't have anything particularly technical, but I'd literally just start from the top left and just work down to the bottom right, kind of similar to what I do now. But I wouldn't do panels or anything, but I'd just, just fill it almost Jackson Pollock-esque with drawings. To me, it looked like a narrative flow, but it would just, once I'd finished a page, it just, I wish I'd have kept some, but I never did. Um, just, just all these drawings everywhere. And I'd probably, a young age, just just say the draw, say the words out loud as I'm going along, and do all the sound facts. You're going bow, 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 as I'm drawing them. Um, it probably took until I was about nine or ten to actually start doing stuff in panels. But I never remember copying stuff. It was just all from up here straight away. Right. But you were telling stories. They weren't yes. just single characters or figures or tanks or whatever. No, it no, be. it was always a story. It right. was very rare I'd draw just one illustration. It was always this filling the page with story. And did you, did you publish that kind of work in school magazines or did you send it off? Or? No, I didn't, I didn't actually get anything published, you know, until I remember being, I was, I was uh, for my sins, I was public school educated and at prep school we had this little, yeah, bearing in mind this is, you know, sort of mid to late 70s, uh, this thing called, it was called the broadsheet, and uh, myself and a, another friend who was also good at art, we'd publish a little three strip, that was probably my, literally my first published work, we'd do a, a three panel strip for that, and when I went to, you know, into secondary school, um, again for the school magazine, which is a bit slightly more glossier, and you know, we're in the 80s by now, uh, I'd have the odd strip published in there, but that's kind of pretty much it. Does any of that work still exist? Is that stuff that you... Somewhere out there, yeah. there must be yeah. something, yeah. But you haven't posted it on your website or anything like that? Um, no, I, I, I don't. I don't have any of it. I, even my mum and dad, you know, have, have, I don't know if they've kept a few, uh, but uh, I've not seen that stuff for a long, long time. Well, So at school, um, you had the opportunity to, to do a bit that kind of publication and collaboration with, with some friends. Did you have particularly encouraging teachers? Did you have a, a mentor uh, as a young person who, who kind of recognised that you had talent and, and kind of dedication to that art form and that you were, you were spending time doing it? Um, yeah. Um, I, I, again, especially at secondary, the school I was at, Shrewsbury School, um, the, 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 art, the art room was amazing and the art teachers were equally amazing. In fact, I'm, I'm still good friends with the head of art. He, well, he became the head of art after I left, but he was teaching there. Uh, I'm still good friends with him. Um, he's the only teacher that I, I, I sort of maintained a sort of a strong contact with. Um, they were good in, in terms of they never, they never discouraged me from doing it. But I think because of obviously, especially back then in the, in the sort of early 80s, the rigid format that art at the time O-level and consequently A-level was, it was hard to get them to sort of allow me to do that sort of stuff for, for exam level because it was just the, the system would not allow it. But from their personal point of view, they never discouraged me from doing it. Um, but on the other hand, there were obviously certain criteria you had to fulfill to pass uh, your exams. Ironically, um, just a bit of an aside, when I was doing A-level art, our year, I remember our, our head of art telling us that our year was one of the best art years they'd ever had and there were more people going to, on to art college from that year or onto art foundation than, than they'd had for years and years and years. Um, 
And the funny one, the f even funnier was the fact that I, I was put into printmaking more than um, fine art. It was a kind of, in terms of education, it was fairly limited. There was only fine art, printmaking and ceramics. That's all you could do. And so the guys that you couldn't pigeonhole into sort of classic painting, we were all put into printmaking. And you could argue that that's where all the kind of the more interesting artists were. Uh, or the more that wanted ended up doing more interesting stuff. Um, and uh, that year, we all got really low grades. I got a D in art. Right. <laughs> so, so be encouraged by that. Be yeah. encouraged, yeah, I got yeah. a D in art. Yeah. But then I was re-encouraged when I went to do my foundation course and consequently on to art college where I studied film and video. And they both said, ignore everything about A-level. It's irrelevant. They literally tore up, you know, verbally tore up every single bit of artwork I'd had previously and <laughs> it's kind of what was the point of all that then <laughs> so, so your foundation year and then and then um, a degree uh, yeah. in art do you think that formal education has made a big difference to you um, and your career and your creative life yes and no I think um, it taught me what I didn't want to do <laughs> uh, and I, I think at the time because of the education that I went through I think it was just de rigor that you did that um, and I saw no other way through the system, you know. Um, so it just felt like, oh, yeah, that's what I do. I go on and do an art, f yeah, I'm an artist, therefore I go on and do an art foundation, and then I go to art college. It's as, it, that's how it is. Uh, I, I had no other sort of worldly experience to think there could be another way or anything like that. Uh, but it was useful. I mean, like I said, I did film and video, so it did t teach me, I think, more about storytelling. And it was a, f a sort of fine art film and video. It wasn't very technical. So, of course, then you were more free to explore uh, what films are about as opposed to how they're made. Um, so... I think from that point of view, it gave me a good grounding in, you know, all things filmic in terms of a more critical point of view, which helps with understanding, you know, obviously sequential storytelling. Yeah, yeah. So it informs your, your practice as an artist. And, yeah, And yeah. Your, your collaborations, presumably, with, with, with the writers that you worked with um, since your, your career hmm. started. Well, well, funnily enough, actually, going when I was doing film and video, a lot of people working solo. I was one of the few people that did collaborate. Right. Uh, I, I got people to write the script for me and, and do other things. Yeah, I worked. I, <laughs> yeah, I was the only one making horror movies, for instance, there. And because of that, you know, I was working with a guy that could do a bit of makeup, special effects makeup, and, and things like that. You know, I, I was... I was actually trying to get together film crews to do all this sort of stuff, uh, whereas the other guys were off, you know, you know, th th equally as valid, but just, you know, just, I don't know, just just doing sort of very personal stuff all on their own. Um, so uh, yeah, so I was kind of learning the art of collaboration yeah, as well. Yeah, you know, that's from what you've said. You're somebody who, who's an instinctive or happy collaborator, somebody who likes working. Hmm. Uh, with it, maybe at least one other person. Yeah. Um, and I'd like to sort of ask you a bit more than, uh, about that, because you, you've worked, I guess, with a lot of people now. We, we've talked about the kind of the famous um, titles and characters um, that, that you've drawn for, um, Judge Dredd and Batman and, uh, and most famously, uh, The Walking Dead. And we will, we will get onto some zombies. <laughs> Don't worry, folks. Soon, you know. <laughs> the zombies. Uh, in this country now, you're never more than six feet away or ten minutes away from seeing a zombie either on screen <laughs> or... In no, a, no. Uh, Not in the last point. ten years, that's for sure. Yeah. Um, absolutely. So I, I suppose um, sometimes when we think about the relationship between artists and writers, um, writers often get kind of privileged. Their name might appear first. Um, we might even think in the 19th century, something like Dickens working with Crookshank. Mm. Famously, you know, Crookshank didn't really like how famous Dickens became. <laughs> he, he, he was originally um, better known. And I told you earlier on, Dickens appeared on this, this very stage, I think maybe on that very sofa uh, mm. uh, in the 1860s. <laughs> oh, we, we, good Nick. Yeah, yeah, sure. yeah, we haven't corroborated that fact, but I, we'll go with it for the time being. Um, <laughs> um, uh, so that, that notion that the writer might kind of dominate in that mm. kind of relationship... Um, without betraying any confidences, what's your experience of, of, of working with, with writers and, and how much sort of input would you have? As somebody, you know, who is a storyteller, you know, you've mm. always been a storyteller since you, you started drawing. 
uh, from the top to the bottom of the page. Um, is there a fairly equal um, kind of pairing, or does it depend? I, I always say the best sort of comics is 50-50, you know, yeah. where the writer is just as important as the artist and vice versa. That, that is how it should be. Um, I, I think today's modern trend for the writer to be the big name, you know, the, it's almost like some comics will read, you know, a comic by such and such featuring the artist, almost. Um, I did once have that experience, which was, um, I, I, won't, I won't go too much into uh, to, to detail on this, but I did years ago work with Doris Lessing on, on a comic book, the famous authorist Doris Lessing, and I was literally was billed massive letters for Doris Lessing, you know, featuring, all, it didn't say featuring, but art by Charlie Adlard, and my name was about three times smaller than hers. Um, uh, anyway, but uh, oh, the less said that, the better. But um, I don't think any writer goes out of, of their way to, to, to be the big name. I think just, that's just how, at the minute, they are perceived by the media. Um, it's easier for a writer to become more famous because, obviously, once you get beyond comic books... Um, it's more of a writer's medium anyway. If you're going into film or television, what can the artist do? Well, they can do storyboards, they can do concepts. You know, can, it, it's not stuff you see on the screen, whereas a writer can obviously write episodes or write the screenplay or, you know, that there, there's kind of, in a lot of ways, more stuff a writer can do post, um, post the comic. So I think that, 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 in a lot of ways, and, and now especially, now comic books are big, you know, sort of multimedia events, um, I th their role is a, can, can be a lot more prominent, which puts the artist almost on the back foot a lot of the times. Um, but again, having said that, these things are circular. You look at when Image first started um, 25 years ago, uh, at the time then, the industry was artist-driven. The writer was just the guy that you know, the, the artist, well, the artist would come up with uh, almost the concept and then sort of casually ask some lesser name writer just to almost fill in the gaps for the, for the imagery. And that's kind of how it was for, for that time. We've sort of flipped now, whereas the writer is the, you know, the big I am and, and it's almost like, oh, who can we get in to, to you know, fulfill this writer's vision or whatever, and of course, it's it's other things like, you know, and this is no slight on anybody, but you know, it's a, it takes a lot longer to do the artwork than to write a comic book. Mm -hmm. Therefore, a writer can a stay on a book for as long as they want. They can write, you know, thirty, forty, fifty, <laughs> or in The Walking Dead, one hundred and seventy-five issues, you know, full full on without a break, and do something else in between. Whereas an artist will struggle to do one book. And, that, and suddenly, if you've got an artist who can't do a monthly schedule, if you're putting an artist on for, say, four issues, and then somebody else has to take over four issues or something like that, then the artist's role is diminished because it's not this singular partnership anymore. It's the writer and various. And as soon as you start saying various, it sort of puts the writer in a stronger yeah, and I'm only saying this as the media perceives it, not, not as we perceive it. But, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, the, these things happen, but uh, deep, you know, generally when you're working with, with a writer, there's not that... Um, it's not necessarily sort of one of positioning. rivalry. Uh, no, no, sense, I mean, yeah. every, everyone I work with regards it as an equal pairing. That's from Robert yeah. Kirkman, obviously, through to somebody like Robbie Morrison, who I worked on, White Death and various other sort of... Um, 2000 AD related stuff you know it, it's an equal partnership and uh, we've always seen it like that that's good I mean it's interesting that the, the, um, the Walking Dead is, is, is so long lived the end of the world lasts a really long time doesn't it, it just, um, <laughs> it's lasted yeah. for 14 years yeah, so yeah, far yeah. Uh, <laughs> and you've been there for at least 13 of those years I think yeah, yeah I mean yeah, the, the, the only the only issues I haven't done were the first six but right. I've done everything yeah. else. It, I, I will be personally celebrating 14 years in February. I, mean that, oh, that, I don't know, commiserating yeah, 14 I mean, years. Yeah, that's a lot, a lot of work. I and mean, from what you've said, people don't normally go the distance. No. So, you know, physically be very demanding, I'm guessing. I've, I've heard illustrators talk about getting back problems and those kinds of things because of just kind of 
um, <laughs> you know, standing above the drawing board yeah. day after day. So, you know, it's, it, it, it's physically and, I guess, kind of creatively an act of endurance. You've been doing other things at that hmm. time. I don't call it an act of enjoy. Yeah. I do enjoy doing yeah, what I do. Yeah, right. So <laughs> I'm there's like, still pleasure in it. Yeah. For you. If it wasn't pleasurable, I certainly wouldn't be doing it. It's yeah. not a job you do if you hate it. Right. There's no way. I mean, yeah. you imagine what it would look like if you disliked every panel you drew. Mm. Um, you know, it, it's it's just not worth. No matter how much money they would throw at you, doing something if you don't want to do it in a creative industry is not is not yeah. a good thing. What about? I mean, it's relatively bleak. I mean, I'm not saying there's no humour. Um, what, my life? No, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it. <laughs> Walking Dead's fine, but um, yeah, I'm kind of disturbed by it. <laughs> but you, you're writing about a kind of, um, you know, quite an unhappy version mm. um, of reality and, um, you know, a world of disease and loss and constant grief and violence uh, and all of that. And that's maybe the happier issues. But um, <laughs> um, uh, I mean, is, is, is that a, a, a particular challenge, or are you able to kind of distance yourself from the subject matter in that Well, I, th I, th I, think, I think every creative person realises that, that, you know, what makes art is drama, isn't it? And generally, if everyone's happy, there is no drama. Right. Therefore, you know, pretty much there is no art. Yeah. So, you know, you've got to come... First off, you've, gone f you've got to come from a space of drama, haven't you? So... Uh, and you know, look at me. I don't look particularly dark and gothic, and I don't. I don't work in the middle of the night. I actually work nine to five in a very brightly lit, you know, sort of studio that looks over a nice country field. Um, you know, everything in my life is the opposite to The Walking Dead, and yet I draw this really quite nasty comic. And but you know, I, I prefer my stuff darker. Uh, I, it, it, it is. It's more interesting. The darker you get, the more interesting characters you get out of it. I, I like my... I kind of like... I've always been, like... With music, I've, I've always been a minor chord sort of person. Right. I've never been a major chord sort of person. And I think I kind of like that in comics as well. I'm a definitely a minor chord sort of comics person as opposed to a major chord. That's a good... Comics person. Good takeaway quotation for us. Do, do, do other Thank art you. forms then feed into to your, your work? I mean, do you listen to music while you're drawing? Do you have to have silence? No, I do. Well, I listen to the radio um, because I'm a big, I am a big music lover, but I... Um, but that's a problem in a lot of ways. Being a big music lover, if I was playing my records and my CDs or whatever, I'd find it too distracting. I, I mean, I'm one of these people that has to listen to the right. thing yeah. rather than have it on in the background. Yeah. So the radio is the perfect... I don't like silence, the radio. So the radio is the perfect... Whether, whether it is listening to, say, I'd listen to a lot of Six Music stuff or listening to podcasts. I can listen to podcasts and things like that right. um, because that doesn't involve... Uh, it's weird. I can listen to that. Well, it doesn't involve the reaction back, I think. That's, that's, whereas with listening to music you like almost has this sort of you need to react back to it whereas listening it, it listening to podcasts is more passive right so it kind of therapeutically somehow it works for you as yeah, yeah 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 it just brushes over i mean sometimes i'll be if i'm it depends sometimes it depends what i'm doing because if i'm uh if i'm reading a script and laying stuff out um obviously i'm concentrating on reading script mm. and if i'm listening to there's no point in listening to a podcast yeah. or some talk on the radio. Music is better than because you're not taking it in anyway. But as soon as I've done that and I'm just sort of uh, going over the pencils, improving the pencils or inking or something like that, which involves less actual concentration, um, it's more intuitive then, I can listen to stuff and it does go in then because that part of my brain is open. And what about um, visual, other visual media? You're a you know, visual guy... That's how you've um, uh, practiced as, a, a, as an artist throughout your, your career, as somebody who's drawing. Um, do you um, respond to television and film, and does, does that have an impact on the style in any sense, do you think? Ooh. Um, I mean, it probably does subconsciously. Um, I, I am very much, I think, as any artist is, especially if they're drawing something from you know, real life, and most comic books are at some point, at some level, you know, based on some sort of reality. Um, you, are, you, are constantly having, you are constantly 
having your eyes open. You know, I, I quite often find myself, whether it's sat in a coffee shop or just walking around town or anything, suddenly staring at somebody because they're sat in an interesting position or they've got an interesting face. And, and then you've got to sort of, and then of course you do the classic when that person looks back at you and you go, like that, <laughs> and and then you think, oh God, did they think? I, if especially as a female, you think, do they? Are they sitting there thinking you fancy them or something? Because you've been staring at them for, you know, and then you get all paranoid. Then you have to leave the shop. Looks even more suspicious yeah. then, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, no, I think you do that subconsciously as as an artist, and it, it must rub off in film and television as well. Um, just, just sort of always looking at, and and, and actually, it, looking at TV and film or, or anything on, you know, on the screen is is almost better because everything's obviously so well lit, and so you've got much nicer shadows and everything across faces and, th and things like that. So you are sort of always taking stuff in. Your mind's always open. So I mean, one of your tips, in a sense, as an artist, is that kind of attentiveness yeah. that you, you, you have to be alive and, and focused mm. and or mm. taking things in one way or another. Uh, absolutely, all the time, you know. I, I, th I think, like I keep saying, it's, it is a subconscious thing half the time. You are sort of taking in almost without knowing. Um, of course, the older you get, the more your memory goes. So the problem is you, you look at something going, I must, must remember that position or that, you know, and then, of course, you can't. and It's just depressing. But... <laughs> Do you think your artwork has, has changed? I mean, even in the, the 14 years that you've been working on uh, The Walking Dead, um, if you look at those, those oh. early panels to the ones that you're doing now, do they look different to you? Oh, absolutely. I, I, think, I think it's really interesting. It's, it's, if nothing else, it's a really interesting experiment to look at how my art's developed over 14 years and, and how I've refined figures and faces and landscape and anything. Um, I'd like to think, obviously, it's improved. Um, but I'm, I'm a big advocate of the phrase to know, uh, to break the rules, you've got to know the rules first. Right. Um, I'd love to break the rules, but I still think I'm learning the rules, unfortunately. And I don't know if I'll ever get to a stage. I, I've noticed my artwork just constantly get more and more realistic. Right. Um, I'd love to break that. But there again, half of me sort of thinks... Yeah, but I'm still learning, so I can't break it. I'm not allowed to break the rules because I'm still learning. Once I've learned, but, you know, I might get reach the age of 80 and I still might be learning, so I might never break the rules. I admire the artists that do actually break away from that. Someone like um, uh, David Mazzuccelli or something like that who, who took his art to that fantastic level of realism and then all of a sudden decides to do something so left of center and has since done so. I mean, God, uh, that, uh, that is, I, I, you know, he's one of my main influences. I look at that and just think, whoa, to, to go from that to that is quite incredible. I mean, that's great. I was gonna ask you about those people you admire now, and that's, mm. that's obviously one person. Are there peers um, that you work with and collaborate with, or is there anything you're reading at the moment you recommend um, to our audience? Yeah, uh, gosh. I mean, you know, I could list a number of artists, you know, sort of, and I, yeah, just, just dozens that, that, that are influ influential on me. Everything from, you know, Will Eisner, Jack Kirby, through to probably my favourite classic artist, which is Alex Toth, uh, the master of black and white and, and, and how... Uh, how to just keep every single panel exactly what you need and nothing more. I mean, you know, he, he was like the Saul Bass of comics right. <laughs> sort of thing. Um, you know, through to you know, a lot of modern day artists. Um, I, I tend to lean towards a slightly more illustrative artists in terms of especially, you know, kind of um, comic books, um, uh, which is just kind of a very vague thing to say, but because um, another big sort of, uh, 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 thing of mine is is kind of uh, American UK illustration illustrative art of especially the 60s sort of magazine kind of illustration film poster art all that kind of Bob P Bernie mm. Fuchs those sort of guys um, so any any artist that takes those influences uh, into comic books I'm, I'm instantly a fan of 
So uh, kind of a lot of that, uh, and, and I like to think I also take those influences and I try and get as, shall we say, illustrative as possible. But those guys I like because they, they married the incredible um, sort of devotion to detail and life and realism to an incredible sense of design as well. So it wasn't just you looking at it and going, oh, that's really you know, detailed. You know, in fact, detailed artwork sort of kind of puts me off. I like it when it gets a bit more impressionistic. But what they did was this sort of level of design on top of it, which right. just gave it that little extra uh, something else, which is just just you know just my kind of my kind of thing. That's great. That's really interesting to hear about your kind of taste and your formation mm. and so on. And um, we're about to to move on to questions from the audience. I know there'll be. Uh, lots, but I'd like to ask you um, one last question before we move to that, and that's really um, about the rest of your work. Um, so people will know um, The Walking Dead, uh, you know, it's ended up on television. I don't know if anybody's heard of that, there's a little known TV series. Um, um, <laughs> yeah. You should check it out. Um, so people know you for that, and it's been mm. going on a long time, and it's, you know, as far as I know, it's no, shown no signs of stopping. Nope. It's kind of it, it's, it's, it's unlike an awful lot of things. Most narratives are defined by the fact that we know they're going to come to an end. Yeah. And this is kind of almost endless. It tracks a life, it tracks other lives, um, and, it, and, it's, and it's continuing. Um, but you've done lots of other things at the same time, and, and perhaps less well-known, mm. uh, and maybe more independent. I'm not saying that it doesn't start off that way, but it's, in some ways it's part of the mainstream now, uh, in all sorts of ways, because it's well, so well-known. So um, I've been reading, for example, um, The Curse of uh, Wendigo, um, set in World War I, um, and there's some overlap in some ways with the kind of, you know, a world of violence and so mm. on, uh, the, the supernatural dimension. But, but, you know, if people were to ask you, is there a piece of work that you've done that you're kind of particularly proud of that's less well-known than The Walking Dead, what, what would that be? Yeah, I, well, I, to be honest, I all, I all cite one particular book, and that was um, White Death, uh, which was written by Robbie Morrison. Uh, I keep saying a friend of mine as well. Um, it, it was kind of interesting. Its gestation was interesting because it was born out of my frustration with working in the sort of the commercial American comic book industry. Um, I just finished my run of the X Files, which you know is no secret. I was not happy bunny with by the end of it. Uh, so I've. Uh, even though I wasn't happy with the X-Files, I've got a lot to thank the X-Files for because it inspired me to do White Death, which is basically my first ever creator-owned book. Uh, well, co-creator-owned with Robbie. Mm. Um, and to cut a very long story short, we, we published it as a, under a banner of Les Cartoonies Dangereux uh, with a group of friends, uh, primarily to get into the French comic book market, which I'm an enormous fan of because if anyone isn't aware of French bande dessinée is, uh, you know, the industry out there is incredible and unique to the French. It's part of their culture as well, unlike over here or the States. Um, it's more similar to Japan in, in a lot of ways uh, because it is uh, so, it, so sort of ingrained in their society. Uh, so we wanted to sort of try and get into that industry with White Death. So it was basically, funny enough, another book set in World War I. Um, uh, the White Death refers to these avalanches which the two sides on the Italian front used to fire their guns up into the mountains to cause these great devastating avalanches onto the, obviously the opposing side. So it was a plot about you know, using nature as a weapon of war. Um, and I drew it in charcoal and chalk on grey paper. So it was... In terms of style, it was incredibly radical for me to d deviate away from the good old pen and ink. Um, it was it was a one shot book, you know, hard, you know, with a spine. It was a hundred pages long, you know. It was everything that a modern day American monthly wasn't. Um, so I still, you know, even though I obviously it was eighteen years ago I did this book, even though I still look at the artwork now and kind of go because it was eighteen years ago. And I'm kind of glad I did, because if I still look at the album and go, oh, I could, I could draw well back then, it's, you know, Christ, yeah, that means I'm on, a, <laughs> right. I'm on the slippery slope downwards now in terms of style. So, um, 
I don't mind about that, but as, a, as an achievement, I, I'm just really proud of that book. And I think Robbie obviously just wrote a blistering story as well. And uh, yeah, I'd advise any of you that have a remote interest in comics to, to go out and, and, and read it. <laughs> And it's still in print? We can still it is still in print. It. Image, yeah. image, thankfully, reprinted it a few years back, so I, yeah. I assume it's still available. It's in hardcover, so that's the whole point. These things stay in print, you know, yeah. uh, for as long as, as, long as there's, there's the numbers still on the shelves. So I, I assume it's still readily available. Yeah, it's not the sort of thing that's going to fly off the shelves. <laughs> it ain't superheroes. No, right. <laughs> but, you know, there's, there's room for, for other characters hmm. than superheroes. Well, and, precisely, yeah, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Indeed. And, and, and lots to talk about this weekend. You're going to be signing at, uh, uh, at Lakes International Comic Festival and you're doing a, I am. Uh, a talk as well or a practical session. I'm not... Yes, I think the Saturday I'm basically sat in a pub. <laughs> <laughs> for most of the afternoon, of yeah, for most of the afternoon signing um, at uh, at the lakes, uh, and then Sunday I'm doing a session in the the Wacom have set up a kind of a, a workshop space all day, and various of us artists are coming in and coming out, doodling on their software, which is great. And I'm oh, doing various things. I'm doing a, a sort of a little kids workshop as well after that. And then I'm doing a panel right at the, near the end of the con, celebrating Image's 25th anniversary with people like Sean Phillips, Christian Ward, um, Jason Latour, who incidentally, you asked me about one of my favorite comic books, who works on my favorite, well, probably my favorite com American comic book, which is um, Southern Bastards. Uh, so it's, uh, it's an amazing read. So uh, yeah, that should be a load of fun. Apparently we're drawing Chip Z Zdarsky. Uh, he's going to be our model. Very and good. he's going to wear some interesting clothes, apparently. He this ain't going to go naked, so don't worry. Uh, yeah, that's good news. <laughs> uh, that's, that's unfortunately where we need um, pretty much to end. I think over to you, Simon, uh, at this stage. Yeah, thank, thank you very much indeed, Charlie. Thank you very much, Andy, for what's been a terribly insightful, informative, engaging, uh, and, and very humorous uh, insight into, uh, into the work of, uh, of one of our, our great comic artists. So oh. thank you both very much. <laughs>